if I had to say I want to watch one minute of Eric Banner on loop, funny people when you're describing <laughs> the footy. Good call. That is elite. <laughs> that was ad lib. That right. was all ad lib. Americans to- couldn't write that. I was working at the Castle Hotel in North Melbourne at the okay. time. Barman. I wish. I was a glass boy. Oh, well, see. it's probably one up from Dish Pig, but that's about it. I had a Dish Pig job at Denny's, actually. <laughs> so my pedigree is pretty outstanding, actually. <laughs> you're always Go destined to be CV. a Hollywood star, weren't you? What is most often when you're walking down the street quoted back to you? Like, is it Chopper or Troy or your accent in Black Hawk Down? Quite often, obviously, it'll be Chopper. How are people's general Chopper impressions when you get them back to you? Pretty average. Right. <laughs> Who says crime doesn't pay? I cannot recall a negative interaction with the public. Right. Like, I am so lucky. How much work goes into a realistic sword fight between you and Brad Pitt? Oh, Jesus, how is so much work. I presume before Munich you had to meet Steven Spielberg? So I go out to the desert and I meet him in his lunch break and I'm just like, what is going on? (laughs) Do you walk into a meeting like that and think, I'm Eric from Tullamarine or not? So well, obviously you have the same of, effect on you. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome to the Howie Games Artist Series. This is going to be happening for a while, but he is here now. He's the dominant star of The Force of Nature, which I watched last night, which we need to discuss. An all-round Aussie legend and a man that loves his sport, so he's perfect for this show. Eric Banner, welcome to the Howie Games Artist Howie, Series. Howie, pleasure to be here, mate. Um, this is, this is uh, Bianca. Uh, your all-round legend is a star. We've been trying to do this for a few years and we're all good to go. And then the writers strike. Never have I read the Hollywood press before to find out what was going. So it is great to have you here. Mate, it's a pleasure, honestly. Yeah, great to be here. It has been a while in the works, but, uh, you know, patience pays off. Exactly. It? Mate, there's so much to talk about. Um, and and we, we talk about sport and your professional career. But talking about sport, I'm, I've just came off the test match in Brisbane um, and it's been a long test summer. And I got home last night and I got the link to the movie and I'd read the book and I said to my wife, I'm cooked early dinner. I'm going to try and push through 45 here. Fair enough. But I couldn't remember who'd done it. And you had me from about three minutes in. So congratulations. Watch the whole thing. Love the movie. Um, I got, I got so many questions for you. I got so many questions for you, but what is it like firstly, when you go and watch the movie, when do you first see the finished operation? Well, it, it's different on most projects. I'm a producer on this one. So with this and the drive, it's very different because I'm seeing, you know, a hundred cuts of the film before anyone gets to see it and in on the edit and so forth. So it's, it's, um, the magic's kind of distilled. Okay. So you sort of end up more in awe of, of the editing process. And because let me tell you, no one wants to see the first cut of a film. Well, it's a bit rough. It's always rough. Is it? And it's all, always needs a lot of work. And it's quite fascinating the journey that a film goes on from beginning to end. Um, but in general, most of the time, um, I am seeing close to a finished work, um, if not a finished work. And it's usually by myself, either in a cinema or, or at home. And it's always a um, daunting experience. I, I really try and divorce myself the first time I watch, really just looking at the big picture. So the first viewing you is usually quite easy. If I, if I catch it a second time, it's pretty brutal. It's much harder to watch. Oh, on you, because are you looking at yourself? Then? Yeah, yeah. Then it's hard, huh. it's harder to. At first time, I can just I'm just a blob on the screen. It doesn't affect me. Second time, I'll I'll be all over myself, um, and it's far more uncomfortable. And, and at that point, if you if you look at something and say, say like. Usman Khawaja is looking at his technique and he's like, ah, I need to change that. So he's working on it for the next test. Can, can you then go back and say, you know what? When we do this, can we cut around this at all because I'm not happy with what I did here or is just, that's it? Um, if I'm giving notes, it usually will be big picture notes about, about the film itself. So not so much about covering my ass on a performance. Okay. You know, and then quite often you can fix tiny things in the ADR in, in, in doing voice work afterwards, but I'm usually aware of it on the day if it's not working. So if it's, if it's, if something's not great, I'll say to the director, oh, I'm just not, this is not feeling great or I think this is too slow. Can we try something different because of the stand up background? I think one of the things that it equips you with is like this instinct that like, this is not, this is not great. This is not hmm. feeling like it's hitting the mark. And I feel like, we're a bit slow. Um, it, it was okay on the page or it wasn't great on the page and we thought we could fix it and we have, let's try and fix it now. Um, 
I think that instinct's always always there, and I'd much rather fix it on the day than try and save it in the edit or, worst case scenario, have to come back six months later and do a reshoot, you know. And that, you're on to, you're on to the next project. Good. It's it's You always get your head around it in the end, but when you get that phone call, you're like, oh, I've had, I've had that shower. Right, you and know? now I've got to go back into it. <laughs> yeah. So so with, with Force of Nature, it's funny that you said your first view is big picture and your second view is you because I knew we were going to be talking about it. The film was a bit peripheral to me. I was watching you the whole time um and you're just so good at what you do oh thanks man. Not, not like you i don't want to be cheesy but because I, I haven't really watched a film just looking at the the character before um i know nothing about filmmaking but it, you're just so convincing like it's it's as as it's folk is it aaron folk, aaron folk yeah it's yeah. you yeah well it's it's um i've always believed that you, everyone can act right it's, True, I could give you a bunch of lines and you can walk on a set. And, yeah. Yeah, but what won't work for the viewer is that reaction that you just gave, right? So that will bleed through. Okay. If you don't feel like you can do it, yep. we're all over it. And so the, 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 the challenge and the kind of journey, I think, for any actor is you have to be 100% convinced that you are that person or you are capable of being that person once you step in front of the camera. So most of the work occurs before, before you go filming. But my favorite ever quote from one of my favorite filmmakers that I've worked with was Ridley Scott on Black Hawk Down in pre-production. I was looking at, at, in the art department, looking at all these drawings and talking to him about some sequences that we had coming up. And he said to me, I've already made the film, right? Just got to go out and shoot it. <laughs> and I thought, oh yeah, the shooting of the film is just the mechanical execution of what's already in his head. He's already been down that road. He's made all those decisions, you know, which I thought was a, um, was an amazing thing to hear at the start of my journey. Cause it's, uh, it applies to acting as well. But yeah. what happens if Ridley, and um, we'll get to, like, we'll get to Munich. Oh, I love that film. And I watched it again on a plane the other day cause I knew <sighs> Richard. I love that film. I've been immersing myself on Qantas flights in your work for the last <laughs> two weeks. What happens then if, if the big name director, like you think, yeah, I've got it. But what he's got in his head, you're not producing. Are they, like, ostensibly we're a sporting show often and, and the feedback athletes get can be quite brutal. Do yeah. you get that direct feedback on a, sometimes, on a movie set? Sometimes you can. And that's okay. That can be exciting because what it means is your interpretation of the scene is different to theirs. That doesn't necessarily mean that either of you is right nah. or wrong. It just means, oh, we're going to do it a different way now. Gotcha. So you've got to park the ego and just go, all right, what are we going to do? Well, what do you want to try? Um, you know, is it too slow? Am I going too fast? You know, am I, am I, am I putting the wrong emphasis on, on her or him here instead of, you know, thinking about it from another perspective. So that's usually a very collaborative. I've only, I've only, I've had very few cases where someone wants to, you know, haul you in and say, Hey, I don't think you, this isn't working for me or <laughs> that very rarely or never happens. So it's usually just a conversation about this is where we're at. Um, some directors are comfortable with showing you the monitor and looking back at previous takes. Um, some actors hate that. It doesn't bother me at all. I don't mind because I'm, I'm happy to, to recognize something that I don't think is working as well. So yeah, they're all different. Two questions about force of nature. One, it struck me as cold and wet, which is what the book is. Yeah. I presume it was winter in yep. Victoria. Where was it? So we stitched a few places together. We we're at Dandenong Rages, Latrobe Valley, Otways, basically. Um, Did you go to Taralgon? Taralgon. It's in Latrobe Valley. It's where I went to school. Um, it's not your movie set type of situation. No, Taralgon. no, it wasn't. Okay, wasn't so Taralgon. you would have been up in the yeah cold, wet. Yeah, and that that's as you as you read in the book. That's that's the location, and that's the weather that's that's there. And and Jane Harper does a great job with like locations in yep. our stories. They're a central part of the drama. And you have to feel like the women are under threat. It can't feel like they're just going for a nice well, comfortable it, it trip. Is, it is. Um, the whole thing is foreboding right mm. from the start, I think because of the weather and how cold and wet it is. The other question I had for you, how many days are you filming that film for? Um, like how many days are you there on set? This was about seven weeks, seven and a bit weeks. 
Okay. Yeah. And so uh, can you just flip in and out of the characters? Like, so when you go to have lunch, are you then Eric? And yes. then as soon as we get to the shoot, you're Aaron again? Yeah. I've, I've, I've heard different stories about actors' approaches and tried different things. And particularly when you're doing accents, when you, you know, when you're doing a lot of work overseas, you know, some people will try and maintain their accent 24 seven or all through the day. And I just find that exhausting. That would be. Exhausting. And also you end up picking up bad habits that you can't hear. Um, so I'm an in and out kind of a guy and I like to pace myself and I, I, I get very tired mentally from, from the focus of, of the job. So it works for me to dive in deep and then towel off and refresh and come in, come in again, you know? So some, some roles might be different than others. Some you'll sort of lurk in the space a bit, a bit more, but generally speaking, and also, I mean, especially if you're a producer, like there's decisions that might need to be made at lunchtime or, yeah. you know, like there's practical so you have to things move that out have of that. to, yeah. Um, We'll talk about sport before we get to your journey. You at the Australian Open men's final? I was. Very lucky. Yeah. Stick it out? Mm. Good Mate. answer. Good answer. Because that was, if you said no, I was like, eh. Mate, I've been lucky enough to be, I was at the marathon, Nadal, Djokovic, Nadal, Federer. I've been to the big, long five setters. And always stuck it always out. Always stuck Good it man. out. Yeah. one thirty, two a.m. I Yeah. I couldn't move the other night. I, I, I was just... Did you think Sinner was gone two sets down? I, I I did, but I was there two years ago when Medvedev was two sets up over Nadal, which was again, to yeah. this day one of the most incredible sporting displays I've seen because the third set, Medvedev was not off his game. He just dropped 3% yeah. in that third set. I mean 3% and Nadal got a break and it was just on. And I'll never forget that because, it, yeah, it wasn't a case of him sort of falling away or like not getting his serve in. It was just this intensity that just managed to just sink a tiny bit. And Nadal, as you know, yeah, it's just point freak. for point. He never had the body language of someone who was two sets down. So, uh, but, uh, but coming back to that, I didn't think the way Sinner played the first two sets that he had the weapons to get past him. I thought he just had to keep staying in the point and hope that Medvedev was going to falter somewhere. And I would love to have heard the commentary on the night, which obviously you can't when you're there because I wanted to hear what they were saying. Um, but it was, it was quite fascinating. I was driving home from the airport late after the test match in Brisbane. So I was listening to on the radio, interesting sport to uh, the radio. listen on the radio, <laughs> cross court, backhand, forehand, backhand, forehand. I'm not sure it quite translates. Do you love your tennis? Like, what, oh, I do. What's your favorite sport? Cricket. 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 Okay. So you're I work cricket on man. cricket and yeah. footy, but um, like I would prefer to surf than anything else, but yeah, I do love calling the cricket and, and the footy, which we'll get to. So when we talk about these sports, okay, can you play tennis? I can play tennis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, what Not are you, great. I are mean, you I'm, a sort of serve volley man, are you a baseline slugging away Sampra style um, or are you coming up rafter style? I'm creative. I'm creative. I'm a bit dinky. I like to, I like to pull out the repertoire. <laughs> okay. A few little slices. That's a bit tricky. Let's just say there's a knee reconstruction that's occurring today because I'm a fan of the drop shot. And it's right. not my knee who's being reconstructed. Right, right, right. So you, you, you caused an ACL is what you're telling with a little dinky one. Especially if I play with men my age. I, <laughs> okay. They're, 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 they better be good runners. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's tennis. Footy. Why the Saints? Just always since I was born, um, my grandparents, my parents, uh, my mother, um, one of my uncles was a saint and uh, I just followed them since, since, I was a, since I was born, really. So what's your first memory of going to watch the saints? First memory is going to Moorabbin <sighs> and standing on cans and being fed through the chicken wire to sit on top of the player's race. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So my uncle used to take me, we lived in Tallamarine, I'd get dropped off to Ferntree Gully and then I'd go to the game with my, with my Ferntree Gully uncle to Moorabbin. And yeah, I'd, I'd spent, I'd spend the days on the, on the players race behind the chicken wire. Um, and then I remember just, I, I remember being so excited when I got my license that I could actually drive from Tallamarine to Moorabbin for our home <laughs> games. That was like the most important thing about getting my license was that journey. I'll never forget the first time I pulled into the Tucker Road primary school car park. I thought, oh, we're on here. This is, <laughs> life doesn't get any better than this. And who, who was you, as a, as a kid, like whose number did you have on your back? Who, who was the man for you? Well, as a kid, I mean, obviously we all love Trevor Barker. I was a big Joff Cunningham fan oh. as well. Now, um, so he came back and played in Terralga, I'm talking about Terralga. Really? For the Maroons. Joffa. And wow. he just used to frighten blokes away from the I'm ball. I'm sure he did. He was a tough man, Jeff yeah. Cunningham. Yeah. 
Um, I loved them all. And then obviously, you know, I was lucky enough to to be there for through the plugger era. And Nicky Winmar is probably my favourite Saints player of all time. Yep. Um, so that era was pretty special. And the Waverley era, you know, all all that. Did you go to the, the Ross Lyon Grand Finals? I've been to every Grand Finals since post my birth. Have every you? final. Yeah, I don't, Have I don't you? miss anything. How was it walking out after getting so close? You're talking about 10? Yeah. To be honest... Nine ripped my heart out more. Okay. Nine. Nine was Geelong, yeah. Geelong. That absolutely ripped me in half. I was I was just devastated for weeks after that game. Um, ten was tough, obviously, the drawn grand final. And the replay was a weird game. Mm. I remember walking into the G week two and it feeling, because all the corporates had dropped off, right, it felt like a big home and away game. Yeah. And you felt the Collingwood Army more so in week two than week one. Um, and it just had this kind of foreboding, big home and away kind of semi-final, qualifying mm. final feel almost. Um, and it was just it was ugly. It was ugly. <laughs> it was bad. Did you play footy as a kid? I did. Played for Essendon Grammar. Right. I now want to hear about this. What <laughs> position? What were you And I want you to compare yourself to a modern day AFL player. Where, oh, were, yeah, you, where, that, where were you? They're all dying to hear that comparison. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was one of the taller guys in our B team and okay. I wasn't that tall. So I had to I had to go ruck forward with a, oh, with yeah. another mate of mine. And I'd sure always got... come up against some beast, you know, <laughs> who, who had a, you know, a mountain man beard and was like six foot six. And I was probably back then about six foot and- yeah, get smashed in the ruck and then and then go down forward. But when I was little, when I was smaller, when I first started playing, I was on the wing. Okay. Because I, I used to do a lot of little ass, used to do a lot of sprinting. So I loved playing on the wing when I was when I was younger. So we were like a, a hard running. I'm just trying to think of who's out in the wing, like sort of Wangani Malera type, or were you a bit more in and under Stevie Baker or big ruckman? Were you more your Rowan Marshall? I, I reckon I was, the, I was on the guy on the half forward flank, constantly waving his arms, <laughs> just trying to hope someone would pass the ball to him. <laughs> who's that guy? Uh, yeah, who's I'm that guy running around time. trying to get a kick? Yeah, yeah, okay, right. So, so that that that's footy, motorsport. Um, yeah. Obviously, you've got a massive passion for motorsport. So when you were speaking about driving down to um, Moorabba, what were you driving at first? Oh, so so I, I've, I've always had the beast, the old the old Falcon. Yep. But I think for for early stand-up days when I was just traveling around, I had an old Toyota Corona that had holes in the floor and was full of <laughs> rust and was mustard color. That I could mustard? Just park. Yeah, oh, it was a shocker. No, but I could I park see. it anywhere. And I was working as a, a you know, in, in bars and stuff as, as a barman as well as while I was doing Santa. So I needed something that I could just park anywhere on the streets of Melbourne and get the job done. So it was a, it was a shitty old four door Toyota Corona. So, so the love, you know, and the beast, I, I've seen the beast. It's, I, I loved it. I loved it. I, I think, um, I think Munich still tops it, but, but I, I think did, it does I, too, I, let's but, be honest. But, but okay. I loved, I loved the beast. So w- with motorsport and you, you still obviously ride your bikes and drive your cars now. So as a, as a viewer, I've had the pleasure of working on the V8s, the MotoGP and sure. Formula One as a kid, which, which, what's grabbing you? If I say, right, we can watch any race this weekend, any category, what are you going for? Oh, uh, MotoGP will be Moto first. MotoGP. Yeah, 100%. Right. Were you surprised by the, when I used to, used to do the MotoGP on 10 with Daryl Beatty, so we'd see the practice sessions as well, Eric, and he would say to me, God, I'd say, I'd love Marky Mark Marquez. I said, he's going to beat Rossi. And he said, you know what? We watch these practice sessions. He throws it down the road so often without getting injured at some stage, this is going to come yeah. and bite him in the ass. And Daz was spot on. Who's your Who's your number one MotoGP? If, you, if you're watching one rider, who is it? Right now? Well, no. In in oh. in, in, in your watching career. Oh. I mean, Doohan was my hero. Was he? Oh, absolutely. That's yeah. Great. And when you consider what he was riding around in terms of injuries, yeah, and the kind of bikes he was riding, I mean. The guy was a freak. I mean, I love Casey Stoner as well. What what he did on the Ducati in particular. Yeah, there's so many. I mean, obviously, I'm a huge Rossi fan. So much respect for Casey, though. Um, I think he had a I think he had a had a harder bike to ride to his world championships and some of the others. Absolutely, he did. Yeah. And of the of the events you've seen live, if you could go back and watch one event again across your motorsport, what what are you going back to watch? A live event yeah. that I've attended as a spectator. Yeah. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to see any motorsport overseas. Okay. 
Um, been to Bathurst a couple of times. You like the Bathurst vibe? I, yeah, I do. But I'd, I'd say MotoGP at the island would be up yeah, there. Yeah, okay. It's a hard track, I think, from a spectator perspective to get a get a sense of just how incredible that track is. I'm trying to think, where would I tell someone to stand? Yep. Knowing that track so well, I'd probably tell them to go outfield, hay shed. Yep. Right? Because you can get, when you get on the, close to the fence there, you're actually... You get the exit out of Siberia, you get that peeling left, you get the right through the hay shed, then they come towards you before they go up to Lukey Heights. And I think you get a real sense of of just how fast they're going. I mean, the, the straight's amazing. Turn 12 always blows my mind, the yeah. speeds they carry through there. Um, but yeah, I'd say MotoGP. Have you done the two-seater around there? I did. Was I it did. the best thing you've ever done? Was it with Randy Mamola? It was with Randy. How good's Randy? It was. I was a bit nervous with Randy because- <sighs> Have you it, done it? Well, yeah, with Randy. And he was a bit too casual for my life. He just jumped on the back, mate. We'll be right. And I'm like, I'm not sure we will be right, Randy. Yeah, it was unbelievable. I mean, selfishly, it was the best thing ever for my track days. Yeah, of course. Because that's my track. And and we had a good chat beforehand and he knew I was a rider. And he's like, okay, this is, what, this is how it's going to be. Acceleration's not going to blow you away. It's going to be amazing, but it's going to be roughly what your brain is going to be expecting. He said, braking will, will probably blow you away. But again, like you'll have a, there'll be a calibration. He said, but I'm going to freak you out on, on corner entry speed. And he was right. <laughs> you can't stop, mate. Stop. I'm like, the amount of load into the front tire in the <laughs> early part of the corner just, just squashed my brain in half. It just, it was like, I had no, there was no tool to calibrate yeah. for that. Coming into turn 12, I was like, oh, we're, go we're, we're, we're joining the line of buses that's going up Cows Road or whatever. We're going straight. For some reason, he's, he's seen an exit that I can't see. We're going down an escape road that doesn't exist. And then he just slightly got on the brakes and just, he said, he said, I'm able to load, this is what scared me. He said, I'm able to load the front tire more than I would if I'm on my own because I've got a passenger on the back. Oh. You know, oh, I think I hate to say it. I think I closed my eyes about halfway around the first. Like, I was loving it so much, but I think I pushed it. I think I had to close my eyes. I loved it, but I was very relieved when he came right. in <laughs> after the second lap or one and a half laps, whatever it was. I thought, yeah, that's enough. That is definitely enough. Unbelievable, yeah. the mo most thrilling thing I've ever experienced. Yeah, I, I'm. I couldn't agree more. And 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 I don't know which bike you were on, but I was on the last year of the two-stroke right. five hundred. Okay. So that's a serious bike. It was just mind-boggling acceleration on that thing. It was just incredible. And you, you do you still get out and ride now for yeah, pleasure? Yeah, I do. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, so you, you like a, a day trip or, a, you know, on the track or? So the island, I'll do, I'll actually trail my, my race bike down there and do do the track day on that. Yeah. So um, that is that is such an incredible racetrack. I mean, you can see why international riders are just so yep. in love with it. Always cold and wet for MotoGP, I found that. Time, like it would either be 40 or that suddenly you'd come in. It's not the greatest month, Howie. No, no, it's, no, it's not. It's not. Watch this space, though. You never know. Yeah. Um, okay, so you. You, as a kid, are you a creative, artistic kid? Like, are you, you know, are you doing pantomimes for relatives or no? Um, I, I never got into drama when I was at school, but I always did impressions. Always did impersonations and accents when I was a kid, oh, but did I, I didn't. I didn't relate that to being creative or anything like that. I and I didn't see a, you know a stand up comedy career. I was just making members of the family laugh and then mucking around at school, getting into trouble or getting out of trouble because of it. Um, but I wasn't in any school plays. I wasn't part of a drama group. I didn't know anything about. I, I was no one creative in my family. The school was very sporty. They were very artsy as well. We had an incredible music program at Essendon Grammar, and apparently there was a drama program. I didn't know much about huh. it, but, but soccer and football were the main things, and basketball were very strong as well. Uh, and you were growing up in Tullamarine? Yeah, I was growing up in Tullamarine. So what's, yeah. your, what's your family's um, heritage? Father Croatian, mother German. Right. Interesting household. Okay. So where did they meet? They met in St Kilda. Oh, so they'd both moved to Australia. Oh, the old dance. Yeah, both both former Bonagilla migrant camp. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, so came out on the boat, uh, went through Bonagilla, spent some time, you know, on the border there. So this, at Aubrey. the end of the Second World War type territory. Yeah, yeah early fifties. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then and then both moved to Melbourne, met in Melbourne, 
and the rest was history. So what did your dad do? My dad is the longest serving Australian employee. He's retired now. He's longest ever serving employer of Caterpillar Australia. Is he? He did 47 years. Oh, what's his name? Caterpillar. Ivan. Ivan. That's an outstanding yeah. effort. 47 yeah. years of service. I hope you got more than a gold watch for 47 years. I think it was a golden D10 maybe on a, <laughs> on a, on a plinth. <laughs> he was in logistics. He was in the in the you know sort of warehouse management logistics area. Right. Yeah. So so the, your as you say you, you skipped drama class. So did you was was stand up your first thing? Stand up was my first thing in okay. Melbourne. Yeah, first show. Yeah. Well, tell me about it. Where was it? <laughs> Were you just packing your dax? Um, well, it was a bit of a sneaky one because I was working at the Castle Hotel in North Melbourne at the okay. time. Barman. As, yeah, but well, I wish I was a glass boy. Oh, you hadn't even Lower elevated run. a barman. At, at that stage, I was You're still- You're a glassy. Glassy. Well, it's probably one up from dish pig, but that's about it. Yeah, did, did that after after hours. Um, had a dish pig job at Denny's, actually. <laughs> so my pedigree is pretty outstanding, actually. You You're always destined to be CV. a Hollywood star, weren't you? <laughs> Denny's and a dish pig and then a glassy. Um, and then there was a, there was a guy there who was like a promotions manager who would put on different nights to try and get people to come in. Cause it wasn't an easy place to get people to come to in North Melbourne those days. And he decided to put on a comedy night and he got a couple of professionals and he said to me, cause he saw me, you know, mucking around after work one night. He said, why don't you give stand up a go? And to me, stand up was like Richard Pryor and, you know, legends, Eddie Murphy. And I said, no, mate, that's not for me. He said, I'll take you to a stand-up venue and show you what it's like. And we went and saw some stand-up and I watched a slew of people get up who were not very good. And then I watched a couple of people get up who were good. And I was like, these, these ones before the good ones, they getting paid? It's like, yeah. What are they on? <laughs> what are they what on? What are they on? So it's a financial reason like, to get involved. Well, well, let's, let's, let's pull the curtain down here. What's this fella on? You know? I was like, well, that, that's, that spot's, you know, about 60 bucks and that spot's about 120 and the, the, the headline is probably on about 300, 400. I was like, I'm, I'm equating it back to my dish pig rates and <laughs> <laughs> my glass boy rates. It's oh, a lot of hours. I see what you're saying, mate. Um, let's, 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 let's look into this a bit further. So we, we had this comedy night at the Castle Hotel and I, I got up as a random, just, just did five minutes. And, um, Prepared, stuff ready to yeah, go. Yeah, I wrote some stuff. I wrote some stuff. And it wasn't a comedy venue. It was just a pub. And that went okay. And then- What um, does okay mean? Like Couple people laughed. Yeah, okay. people laughed. Like it went it went fine. Did you get your 60 bucks? No, I was, that was that was a freebie. Oh, that's almost for nothing. And the, the professional who was on that night was a guy called Peter Fox. And he came up to me afterwards and said, you, you, what are you doing? Like, you got to give this a go, which is very sweet. Um, so there was a couple of early influences, you know, a bit of encouragement. I didn't really see the pathway. So then that was it. I just, I went and started doing tryouts and I got off to a good start and people like, you should give this a go and we'll book you for there and book you for there. And then it was just on and it's just, just kind of gathering momentum. Um, and I gave myself two years. So I'll give myself two years. I don't want to be one of those tragic comics at the back of the room. Who's, what, what are mum and dad thinking? Oh, they're just relieved. <laughs> I'm relieved. That's a good answer, I reckon. <laughs> relieved. We weren't worried oh, about the lad, but he's, he's got some money coming in. up comedy. <laughs> <laughs> relieved. So, okay, so you didn't want to be one of those blokes that, that would, so you gave it two years. So it was I didn't a game want to be plan. a tragic, yeah. Right. So I gave myself two years. Um, and then things things went pretty well early on and not just kind of one thing led to another and I was traveling and touring with some really good comics and learning a lot and working a lot. and So you're up to the 200 or $300 uh, slot now? Probably in the middle bracket now. Okay. Not the headliner, but supporting right. the headliner. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, developing more material. It was sort of ready to go on the road, ready for the tougher rooms, Howie. <laughs> okay. Where's the toughest room you played? Toughest room I ever played in my life? Yep. Private Bin in Canberra. Private Bin? Private Bin was a bar on Northbourne Avenue, slap bang in the middle of Canberra, upstairs, and it was a disco, <laughs> and they'd stop the music, and the DJ would introduce you, and and people would have their cocktails, and they'd be like this, and they'd stop, and they'd annoyingly turn around, and you'd walk onto a stage the size of this desk, and try and hold the attention of three or 400 people. So they're in the middle of, you know, Sweet Caroline, and then, right, let's get to the comic. Tough, tough crowd. Tough. Did you win them over? 
I had a few good gigs there. I had one that was on the tough side, and then I realized, oh, this is the toughest room in the country, and it was a bit of a test, you know. Okay. If you could survive the bin, you could, you could, you could do anything. You could do anything. And know? and the, what's the feeling like when you're up on stage, and there is a, a, a quite a big crowd, and they're actually really laughing and into it, and you're entertaining them. It's pretty addictive. I think the best feeling, I think the be, even better than them laughing is the thought that you know the next piece of material that you're about to unleash is going to work. Okay. I think that's where the satisfaction comes from. <laughs> so it's like, okay, this is great, but having the the space, having this, I guess if you put it back to motor racing, it's almost like you're coming into turn one and you're coming second, but you know, based on corner exit, you've got this guy at turn two. That's a great answer. You know? Um and so stand up for me felt like that when, when you had a, a good amount of material and you knew the crowd and you could sort of predict where it was going to go and you knew that you were doing well with this bit, but you knew the next bit was going to be better yeah. or that you felt really confident that, that it was going to work. That was the best feeling because it's, it's full of so much, um, you know, there are no guarantees when you walk out, no. even if you had a, if you had a cracker night the night before. And as good as your last innings. hundred percent. Brutal. Huh. The so, better you get, I mean, you see great people who are very prolific, you know, they, um, they can get over that if they've got a lot of material, you know, cause it's like a DJ, right? This song's not working. It's, oh, I've got something else in your back pocket. Yeah. So when do you first end up on TV? First ever television appearance was on Steve Izard show. Have you got it on a VHS or something? Somewhere? It's probably on a VHS right. somewhere. And, um. Oh, he's not. He used right? to get, yeah. he used to have comedians on, I think. I think from memory, Friday nights was this like, he would get comedians on maybe a Friday night. Anyway, I was at home and my Nokia went off <laughs> <laughs> and I picked it up and I went, hello. The big brick. <laughs> <laughs> and um, luckily for me, it pays to have a cell phone back in those days. Not many comics had them. Saw it as a good investment. Yep. I thought, well, if I'm not that great, I'll at least be able to be contactable. <laughs> <laughs> Someone had pulled out uh, and they needed someone that night. That night? That night. Oh, I'll never forget it. I might love to have had a heart rate monitor on um, behind the curtain that night because it was, it was you know, like the, right. the shirt would have been like this. <laughs> right. So you were been peaking. Fluffing away. Um, that was my first ever television appearance. How'd yeah. it go? Yeah, it went okay. It went okay. Was, did, went out and did, did sort of five minutes and... Um, I can't remember if I went and sat at the desk afterwards or not. Probably not, because I would have been a completely unknown. Yeah. Um, and so that was that was the first box ticked. So it wasn't red faces or anything like that. It was Steve Izarcho, and then he became a boss. You know, years later, I auditioned for Full Frontal, and yep. his production company produced that show. And, and was that the next major step for you? It was. Yeah, auditioning for Full Frontal. So, so when you so when you get into that, of all the all the enormous success you've had on, what is most often when you're walking down the street quoted back to you? Like, is it Peter or Chopper or Troy or your accent in Black Hawk Down? Like I could go on and on. What's yeah. the one that, but you know, cash, no cash here. Like, well, what's the one you get the most, you reckon? It's really hard to predict um, what it is the person's about to pin you for. Yep. Some, sometimes I can profile them based on age. Demographic, okay. I'm, is it going to be this or is it going to be that? And then it'll be, you fixed your car yet? <laughs> oh, it's a lovely beast. <laughs> you know, quite often, obviously, it'll be chopper. Um, it'll, how, how are people's general chopper impressions when you get them back to you? Pretty average. Right. <laughs> and then I think they get them confused and they're, they're actually doing Neville Bartos instead of chopper half the time. Well, I, I find that sort of the, <laughs> it's, the chopper- It's Vince's line, yeah. no cash. You know, that's yeah. not even my line. Yeah. yeah, well, that's true. That's true. Well, I find I find I get a bit confused between chopper and the kickboxing, is he an accountant in the castle? Yeah. I find I get those two a little bit confused. Con. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and when people recite that back to you, like that's a- from from where I sit, that's a form of expression or love of you. Oh yeah, no, work. it's all at all. I'm so lucky, mate. Honestly, I, I, I don't, I cannot recall a negative interaction with the public. Right. Like I am so lucky. Yeah, like when I that? hear about some people that you know have have a bad time, I, I really feel from because I just you know 
my interactions with the general public are just always so lovely and positive and I feel very lucky for that. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah, okay. Every now and then it might be annoying, but you're always reminding yourself, you know, that's where it's coming from. They've seen something that they liked. Great. You know? So back in the day, I was like the news reporter on Channel 10 News when I was doing the V8s, but I was like the, you know, cut up a tree story before Quarters did the sport. Or, you know, this is the bloke in Epping that's got a cure for Nathan Buckley's hamstring issue. Like, just the real wacky shit. Or there was a UFO and none of what, you know, how he'll go out and report on it. And I can't remember what the thing was, but it was go and interview at like a seedy underground bar on King Street, Chopper Reed. Oh, wow. And I remember walking in there with Fitzy, the cameraman, and as soon as he walked in from the camera, like three quarters of the bar cleared out, like Chopper's associates did not want to be on camera. But I, I remember him as being tremendously engaging when mm -hmm. the camera came on. I presume you had to spend some time with him, did you, before the movie to get yeah. a grasp of what you were doing? Um, I mean, I didn't have to, it was made available okay. and I thought oh. I've got to, I've got to make the most of this opportunity. Um, so it was really beneficial to me just to get a handle. I mean, you don't always want to do that when you're playing a real person because sometimes it can get in the way of your prep. Okay. And was he open to you having a, you know, hanging out to see what he was all about? Yeah. Uh, and he, he always loved to talk, right? So I think, yes. I think having some people coming to listen to him was very appealing to him. He, he really loved to tell stories and hold court. Yeah. You don't get a lot of, you don't get a lot of words in, um, and that's what I was there for, to just, just listen. The, the, uh, I, I got so many questions for you. The, I, I want to know how you get massively ripped when you're in an action movie, but you're a big boy in Chopper. Yep. Like what, what would, what would you have been, how much weight did you have to put on for that? Oh, uh, it was a fair bit. I think back then, I think I started off at around 92 and yep. I think by the time we wrapped, I was around 106, 107. How'd you do it? Not pretty. Was it just like pizza and beer or? It was, uh, yeah, it was, unfortunately I had to take the unhealthy route because we didn't have the time. So you had to do it quickly. Had to do it quickly. We, right. we shot the first half of the film in four weeks and then I had four or five weeks off and we started shooting the second half of the film. And that's when you had to get bigger? It's pathetic when you think about it. Right. Um, so, so I was, I did everything I could and then I was putting weight on during the second phase of the shooting as and well. And how were you doing it? Just junk food. Right. Just a lot of, a lot of calories and junk and sugar and crap and it's and terrible. I, you wouldn't do it again. So mentally, how did you deal with being a fit young man and having to put yourself in that position? Like, I'm sure it's great going the other way, but what mm -hmm. happens when you have to do something that's bad for yourself physically? Um, I was lucky enough. I was young enough at the time. I didn't have to think too much about what it was doing to my body, you know? So I was able to just really go for it and not, not care. And I was just so so obsessed. Well, you know, when you get a role, you're so obsessed with what you've got to do that you don't really think about it too much. I was probably more concerned that, you know, is this going to work? Like, if, am I going to get enough weight on, huh. you know, um, what stage is the camera going to pick it up, you know? And then I remember feeling different. I remember getting more tired and lethargic, remember moving different. I'm like, okay, this is good. This is good. This is good for me. I remember people, people's response was really interesting. I remember going to the footy. I remember going to Waverley one day when I was in, when I was filming. So I was bald with the mo, and I put on a fair bit of weight. I remember people just getting out of my way. Right. And I went, oh, this is why people have that look. <laughs> <laughs> this is why blokes go for a look. <laughs> right. You know, An not, intimidation look. I, was just, I, wasn't, I wasn't doing anything intimidating. It was just, just the people look. just get, people just move a little bit more than they normally would. Um, which, you know, that became interesting. Well, okay, all right, I'll use that, you know. Um, but yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking deeply about what it was doing to my okay. body. If you, if you gave me that opportunity today, I would have to think about it really. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's going to be harder to get rid of to it uh, as you get older, I guess. So then what, what, um, so uh, the movie comes out and becomes huge and it's critically acclaimed. What's it like for the first time when you've gone from accepting every gear you can take and being a stand up comedian and earn your 60, then you, what's it like when all of a sudden you become a desired property? Um, well, the exciting thing about, about that early on is, you know, when an actor goes on a bit of a run early in their career, you know, you have, you have 
choices to make. Yep. And back then there were a lot of movies being made. I mean, we're talking, I mean, I've been very lucky in a few areas of my career in terms of my timing, the timing of starting stand up comedy, my timing of being able to work in sketch comedy, my timing in terms of stepping into the okay. film world, which is very, very fortunate in all three areas, right? Um, so there's a lot of films being made back then. If, so if you, if you were a young actor that was on the rise, there was, it was a really good amount of choices. I just decided early on, I'm just going to work with the best people I can. I don't care what the size of the role is. Okay. I'm, I'm not in this to be big. I just want to, want the best possible work. And that means working with the best possible people. That was, that was my focus. You know, it was like, who's the best engineer? You know, who's the best race engineer? What's the best team? Okay. Don't care where I sit on the grid. Um, so you're part of Red Bull, so it's going to shape yep. up well for you because it's going to be successful. Yeah. Huh. Give me Adrian Newey. Yeah, you Adrian know? Newey, <laughs> Christian Horner. Are you happy to be Sergio Perez to Max? Uh, well, early on you are. I, yeah. mean, I mean, you look at Black Hawk Down, there's like 33 of us. Yeah. Unbelievable um, cast when you look back. Oh, like, that's one of my favorite movies of all time. I you love go through that movie. the IMDb cast list on that and it's like, oh my God, he was in it. Yeah. Oh my God, he was in it. Oh, Ty Burrell. Oh, Orlando Bloom. Oh. Bill Fickner, Kim Coates, uh, yeah. Nicholas Costa Waldau. Uh, it just goes on Eric and Banner. on and on. Josh Hartnett, um, Tom Sizemore, Ewan McGregor. Like it just goes on and on and on. Where was that filmed? In Rabat, Morocco. Oh, Rabat. I've been to Rabat. Right. Okay. How long did you have to go to Morocco for? Uh, I was there for about five months. Did you go to Essaouira and get barreled? I did not leave for a bat. <laughs> That's a surf spot. That's a no. I've heard. Of, I, right. I've heard. I've heard they were very beautiful. Let's just say that the standard of driving was such, <laughs> yeah, that I said to my wife, and we had our son with us, who was at that stage eighteen months when he arrived. He was two when he left. I said, "We're not going anywhere. Right. We're, <laughs> we're on lockdown until this film's and up. And how long I'm were you getting there? you guys home alive? How long were you there? Five months, I think. Wow. Yeah. So. Two questions about that. So then you, we hear you with accent for the first time, right? Um, do you just learn the accent for the lines you have to say in the movie or does that not cut it? Do you have to have a, a greater sphere of the accent? Yeah, and, no, you definitely have to have a greater sphere of the accent because you don't get to choose the words and what happens if they change the lines on the day? Right? <laughs> you might be a bit caught short there yeah. when you're Southern American and then you drop an Aussie because they've changed it. Yeah. Okay, that makes so, sense. So, yeah, and as you go along, whether you're doing a British accent or American that's from a different region or a European, you're studying the whole thing and then you start to get more specific and then you'll you'll use the actual lines in the film as a, as a base and then you'll really break that down because there'll be, there'll be some words... And it's the same as for any actor, doesn't matter which country they're from, that for their for their native tongue, there are words that are harder than others. Yeah. So you'll either put more, more work into those or you'll change them. Okay. And then you always have a chance to fix it in ADR, you know. So you also don't want to be panicking about it on the day that if something happens or something doesn't sound right, that you let that distract you. Uh -huh. And good directors will just go, doesn't like, we'll deal with that, you know. But generally speaking, you'd want to be perfect on the day. Yeah. Uh, so how, it's going to be hard for you to give me an exact answer. Give me a general hour, a uh, gen general thought, you know, that, that, that 10,000 hours to become a master of anything. Like how many, like you will have not done it in an hourly perspective, but how mm. many hours do you reckon goes into producing a accent for a movie for you? Like, are we talking 10 or a thousand? Oh, no, it's a lot more than 10. And it depends on what it is, you know, like I did a film about five or six years ago in Cape Town, South Africa. I was playing a, a, uh, hardened white supremacist criminal who was South African so, and it was really South African. So African, African, South African. S yeah. Ach, my friend. From, from, and it was period. Right. right. Oh. And, I'm, and I'm off and Forrest Whitaker's playing Desmond Tutu and everyone is, it's hev heavy South African. So that's the first time I'm doing that accent. So that, then it's like a bit of a journey of research and finding the right coach for that accent and then putting in the work and doing most of it from afar, obviously, because I live here. So you're doing most of your prep, all your prep pretty much from afar. And then you get to the location, then you bump it up and, you know, then you're surrounded by the sounds and it either gets easier or harder. And then wow. 
and then you're getting ready for day one of shooting and you just you're trying to get everything perfect for that and not getting ahead of yourself you know well if he's not talking on day one well then let's not stress about day one it's day two i've got to panic about or you know so yeah there's many many hours that go into it a lot of chatting in the car on your own right just talking to yourself yeah and then on on a so if you see if you pull up at a set of lights <laughs> And you're in the old Ford Beast and you're chatting to yourself. I'm having, a, having an animated chat. You know what I'm doing. Um, so then a film, like an action film like that, what's it like when you're in the Humvee and there's helicopters and like, that, that's got to be a whole nother. Like Black Hawk Down, you Yeah. Mean? Yeah. Like, I mean, is it, is it, like we see it as on scale on yeah. the screen. Is it on scale on the set? It is. So I'd say there's probably two big films I've been in, which is Black Hawk Down and Troy. And luckily enough, at the time we filmed both of those films, everything was done organically. What does Bugger that mean? all was done digitally. Okay. Like, so it actually has to happen. Has to happen. Okay. 90% of it has to happen. So the number of people, the number of, the amount of gear, the number of explosions, the number of RPGs, the number of helicopters, it's happening, mate. Like you feel like it's on. Is and it mind blowing? It is. It's deafening. So it is an assault to the senses. I'll never forget the, f the first live action take on Black Hawk Down. The first take. Afterwards, every actor just looked at each other and just was in shock <laughs> of the noise. You know, it was just that immediate adjustment going, oh, God, okay. Because like, it affects your concentration, you know. And um, so it is, yeah, and then you're just pinching yourself, right? You're just pinching yourself like, I can't believe we're doing this. And everyone's excited. Everyone's as excited as each other. Do they tell you, right, this is, there's going to be an explosion to your left and a right so you don't end up going to the wrong spot and getting your ankle blown off? Or how does that work? Uh, ideally, they'd... <laughs> I'll be concerned about the word ideally, Ideally. You de that was a movie you had to you had to look out for yourself. Yes. yes there, there's safety on set and so forth, but Ridley runs fast and he runs loose. And the first AD was, you know super experienced and he runs fast as well. So you really had to pay attention. You really had to be careful and you, you could very much get hurt on that film if you weren't, if you, if you weren't careful. Biggest okay. issue for me was other actors with guns um, in terms of where their guns were when they were firing them and, 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 and we're using, you know, similar to AR-15 sort of style military weapon that's, you hold the trigger down and it's going. So what, what is it like shooting blanks, obviously? Yeah, but it's still, you know, wow. your ears don't know they're blanks. Okay. So it's full on. It's full, and you haven't got earplugs in. Wow. You know, for most of it. So, um, yeah, if an actor fired the gun too close, you'd have a word with them. And what happens amongst these pyrotechnics and the expense to get the shot if something if someone gets their part wrong, like I, I guess you can't just go back and say, "Can we spend another twenty five thousand on that explosion?" Yeah, you don't. You just don't. So you you've got to get it right. Got to get it right. Right. And you hope you're not one of those guys that's got a line at the end of a sequence. <laughs> that's what and you hope. And you bumble and stumble yeah. it out. You hope that your line is the first thing that happens when they yell action, <laughs> and they pan from you to the helicopter. <laughs> you don't want <laughs> boom, 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 boom. <laughs> And then here comes Howie with his one line. Uh, oh, sorry, guys. Can we do that again? Okay. So then the physical, uh, which film is, is Troy the one where you've been in physically your best shape? Like where you have to turn up looking like a bloody warrior? We never really spoke about how I was meant to look. Um, that was sort of up to me really in terms of, okay, well, what? How, how would he look? Well, it's just going to come from all the work I'm putting into preparing for the role. It wasn't like I, you know, I was at the gym trying to get a bodybuilder shape or anything. It was like, well, I was training extensively sword fighting and fight choreography. I was, you know, spending a lot of time on a horse. I was training and it was like, I'm going to end up in whatever shape that ends up okay. being. You know, it was, there's not a lot of like, you know, shirts off in front of the mirror. I feel like net today it's different. I feel like, People are very aesthetically driven. Very much so. Very aesthetically driven. And, you know, it's all about, you know, the six pack and the this and the that. It's like, well, okay. Yeah. Right. And, you okay. know, um, the, the most ridiculous shape I've ever been in was on, was on Black Hawk Down. I didn't have my shirt off, you know, 
I was my body fat on that was so low, and that, but again, that was a result. That was not what I was. So that wasn't being setting in the gym. out to do. That was just the training required. It was, well, it was me being obsessive about the part. It was a byproduct of what I wanted to do as that character, and I'd heard so much about him. He's based on a real person, and it's like, oh no, he's the elite of the elite. You better step up. So it was a whole mindset thing. It wasn't. It wasn't about oh, because I was actually quite slight for that. Yeah, but but if you saw me with my shirt off, it was a completely different sort of thing. But I wasn't thinking about that. No. I was just like, I'm playing hoot, and this guy is is who he is, and I better prepare in such a way. So what did you have to do to be prepared to be him physically? What were like were you throwing steel or were you running or like from a from an athletic perspective? From an athletic what were you perspective, doing? I I I was um, the most disciplined I've ever been in my whole life. Food wise, food wise. Um, in terms of training, I trained six days a week. Um, wasn't crazy amount of hours because I was very cautious of recovery and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, it was just, it was very meticulous um, and disciplined. Like there was no, there was no, you know, cheating. There was no alcohol. There was, there was just, there was no, sh no donuts. <laughs> Did you feel, <laughs> no donuts. Did no you feel amazing? Yeah, I felt amazing, and I and I kept it going through the whole shoot because I was so scared of not of of jumping out of that mindset. Once I was in it, it was just that was it. Um, that's funny actually because we had some actors on Black Hawk Down who, who turned up, you know, in shape, cut to craft services and the catering, and you know, to feed that many people. Well, you can imagine every lunchtime it's fries, right? So if you want to go back. <laughs> And watch that movie. There are some moments where someone fires their gun, ducks their head down behind a, 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 a concrete wall, yep. comes back up five seconds later. Might look like they've put on 10 pounds. <laughs> they were having too many fries at the lunch break. No, like just in terms of, well, we, we, shot, we shot you running down the street today. Right. We're going to shoot you coming around the corner in four weeks' time. This is stuff you have to think about as an actor. And so on that, are you completely clear or is it made clear to you what you're doing that day in relation to the bigger picture of the film or it's just this is what we need you to do today? No, so you've got a schedule. Um, it's usually pretty detailed for the for the next day. It's it's rough for the day after that and then it's pretty loose for the rest of the week. You'll, you'll try and get a sense of the order of the general filming, but they don't like to give out too much information because every shoot is 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 a problem trying to be solved and depends on weather and locations and actor schedules. And I'm always there for what they call run of show. So I'm always there well before we start filming. I'm there to, to the end. I try not to plug in and out. But you always have a lot of actors who are plugging in and out and so okay. you're trying to schedule around them. And we're going to shoot, sorry, we're going to shoot that scene tomorrow because how he's, he's got to get back to his podcast, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's always out of order. It's never ideal. And that's part of the challenge. You try and break down the script and work out. I mean, I remember on Troy, the very first, my first day on that film was me, uh, saying goodbye to my wife and child before going out to fight Achilles. So you've day right one. the back end, right? Oh, okay. I'm about to die. Okay. I'm saying goodbye to my wife and child. Okay. And action, you know, <laughs> go and, and say goodbye to Saffron and then go and kiss the baby. And now we put on the armor. Okay. Day one. So it's never, it's never as you imagine it. And then in that film, when you're like, so you, how much work goes into a realistic sword fight between you and Brad Pitt? Oh, Jesus. How is so much work. Is it? Oh, so much work. So it's not the boys just roll up, Eric, you have to no, swing the sword this fight. way. Right. Not Tell me about fight. that. Tell me about that. So I had probably five big sequences in that film that I had to train for. Um, so again, it's it's like back to the accent thing. It's like you can't just learn the choreography that for that piece. You've got to learn general sword play to a vast amount so that you can then, I guess it's like if someone was doing a karate film. Like you've got to just got to learn a base so that they can then yes. teach you on day. So you're learning a base and then you're breaking it down into the five fights and then you're getting to the stunt team and then they're breaking it down chronologically. This is the one we're going to shoot first. So they know. We know that that Hector Achilles is at the end of the film. Like, okay, that's five months away. Wow, okay. That's quite daunting. So on the one hand, you've got time to learn it, but at the same time, you kind of want to get it done. 
So they so you're going in order, and you're really hyper focusing on the next fight, and they're you're working with the stunt team to hone that, and you're not working with the other actor at that point because you don't want to stuff each other. You're not good enough to be working slowing each other each other down. Huh. So you're working with their double, and they're working with your double, and the doubles there not for on screen stuff, but for the training and the prep. Um, so months and months and months and months and months. By the time I got to that fight, I knew every move from start to finish with my eyes closed, like every, the whole fight. And it was funny when we went and did the, the voiceover stuff at the end, like just for breaths and efforts. I remember jumping into the studio and it was like six or eight months later and they had a microphone on the thing. And I said, can you just hang a mic from the roof? Cause I remember this fight. I'll just do the fight. And try and pick up as You're much. Still in it's your head. easier for me to do it that way rather than standing still and watching. And it was still in my body, like it was so ingrained. It was still, still there. And when you're doing it at the time with Brad, what level of intensity is it at? Is it, is it, is it acting to get your sword in the right spot, or is it swinging your sword as hard as you can because it's a fight to the death? That's a really great question, Harry. Oh, because finally, Tommy. Yeah. Two hundred odd episodes. We've got a good no, one away. It is. Because in a perfect world, you want to be able to see the acting in a, in a, in a sequence. You don't want to see a series of moves. And I think what's happened to, to a lot of action sequences these days is you may as well not have learnt the bloody thing. You know, it's two moves cut, three moves cut. Like, really? I spent six months on this and you're going to cut this up like, you know, okay. like a piece of sushi. Like you want to work with directors who are going to hold the frame. So I knew... Um, so, so in that instance, you want to know the fight so well so that you can act the emotion that's behind it. And I, I work with great stunt guys on that, that film and they would just keep drumming that into me. Where's Hector at now? Now he's step, we're stepping up the desperation. Like he doesn't know he's going to, he thinks this is the point where he thinks he's going to win, I reckon. This is the point where he's starting to get overwhelmed. Like how do you play that while still trying to hit your marks? Well, you can only do that if you know the moves down perfectly you can't yeah, be thinking okay. about is it left and right and okay. get it up here and you know um so that's what and, and we had a great second unit director simon crane who was very big on do not tell me you're ready do not waste my time your energy we're only going to roll the camera when you guys are 100 percent ready to go at 110 percent don't do not waste so your energy with on. an 80 90 percenter yeah, and he could just feel it. He'd just go, I reckon you're getting tired. Let's just take five, you know? And when you're doing that, is it hard not to get lost in Brad Pitt's eyes or not? He's <laughs> a good looking man. I had to get out of that habit very early. <laughs> right. early. It was him and um, the, the the other film, I've forgotten the name of it now, and it's, I can't, I know him as Riggins from Friday Night Lights. Taylor. Oh, Taylor. Is it Hirsch? No, what is it? No, Taylor Kitsch. Taylor Kitsch. Yep. What's the film? You and Marky Mark. Lone and Survivor. Now, now, great film. Another very good looking man. Good looking man. Fa as we were watching this, my wife said, you've got to ask Eric about. Very sweet. Very okay. sweet man. That's good to hear. Yeah. Um, I presume before Munich, you had to meet Steven Spielberg? Yes. So I, I don't know how you view it. As, as, as a casual movie, movie viewer and a Star Wars and Indiana Jones, like I would imagine for me, he'd be like, wow, is... Do you, do, you, do you walk into a meeting like that and think, geez, I'm Eric from Tullamarine or not? Wow. Well, um, so well, obviously he had the same of, effect on you. Yeah, absolutely. And it was heightened because he was shooting the terminal with Tom Hanks out in the desert. I just, funny story, I just happened to be in LA because we were doing reshoots for Troy because the wall of Troy got, got blown down in a hurricane. Brad and I got sent home for a month or two, told, stay in shape, keep up your choreography, come back and we're going to reshoot it. I came back and I got to LA and I turned up to a fight studio just to get, get warmed up for a few days before shooting. Brad turned up with a moon boot on. He on, torn Brad. his Achilles and hadn't told anyone. Rather ironic, really, the name of his character. hundred <laughs> percent. But you got my number, Brad, let me know. <laughs> right. And we all looked at each other and thought it was a prank. And he started trying to hobble around. He said, no, I'll be okay in a couple of days. And Simon Crane just took one look at him and looked at me and went, we're not doing this. No. Off you go, back home. So by pure luck, I was in LA. Um, and my agent said, Spielberg wants to meet you. And 
I had, by pure coincidence, read Vengeance okay. off my own back because I'd read a lot of stuff. And he said, it's secretive. No one knows what this project is. No one knows why he wants to meet you. But these are the rumors of the projects he's developing. Blah, 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 blah. So I go out to the desert, to the set of the terminal, and I meet him in his lunch break. And I'm just like, what is going on? <laughs> Tom Hanks is there with his, in his Airstream. <laughs> says a quick hello, and I'm in awe of him. And Stephen starts talking about this project. And I just remember, I remember the sense of relief that I wasn't flat-footed and I was able to say, I've, I've read that Jonas book and I'm huh. aware of that story and are you talking about the Arvna character? And we just spoke about it and he said, I, I just, I, I, in his way, he said, I, yeah, so I'd really like you to like you to play Arvna and it just washed over me. I didn't, it didn't really sink in. Um, and I was like, I think he, and I hopped in the car and I was driving back to the hotel and, my agent called and he was like, tell me exactly what he said. I said, I think he said, I think he said, I, I want you to play. I, I'm pretty sure that's what he said. He said, you damn right he did. You know, like I just got a phone call, blah, blah, blah. And it's just this surreal moment of like, oh my God, not only am I going to work with him, but I'm going to work with him on this project. Like just being so excited. Yeah. And are you tremendously proud of that film? I, as I said, I watched it again, Brisbane to... Perth before a big bash final the other wow. day. And it was as good as I remembered that film. Yeah. And no, I'm very proud of it. Um, I think it's a beautiful film. It is. It's incredibly well shot. So Janusz Kaminski, who's Stephen's DP, director of photography, is I think one of the best of all time, if not the best of all time. So to watch that film is a masterclass in cinematography and the relationship between a director and a cinematographer working together the way that the action's composed and the drama's composed, the, the way it's edited, it's, it's just, I just pinch myself that I'm in it. And I would do that every day. Huh. It's a period film. It's like, this is my favorite genre, 70s thriller, you know. I, I only beaten for me, this is going to disappoint you creatively. You're a I'm, Nugget fan. Well, no, 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 I am a Nugget <laughs> fan, but even more, even more than the Nugget of your... 30 odd years, a wide breadth of work. If I had to say, I want to watch one minute of Eric Banner on loop. Funny people when you're describing <laughs> the footy <laughs> to your man, Adam Sandler. Yeah. Okay. Good call. That That is elite, <laughs> Eric. Were you involved in the scripting of that or was that delivered to you? That was ad lib. That right. was all ad lib. Was it? Yes. I was hoping you would say that. Yeah. The, we... We Americans to, couldn't write that. 